Ian, you asked one of the the most profound questions that comes to D and D and creating an experience and really getting the most out of the game, which is again, how do you leave players with more energy than they came to the table with? A component of this that doesn't get talked about a lot, or in fact, the discussion of which gets discouraged by, um, in my opinion, too many people is the structure of your game um, going so far as to be transparent with the game mechanics. And what I mean by that is um, this kind of, this cycles back to, uh, I think it was an article by Roger Ebert. And if anybody is like way more educated about this and wants to call me out on being ignorant, you feel free. But um, so Roger Ebert had this really famous opinion that video games could not be art that, um, and the reason for that is because they could not transcend their structural medium. So whereas a film, you could immerse yourself into the film because editing techniques and stage design could hide the structural aspects of its production um, behind techniques. Like, unless you're breaking the fourth wall, you don't see like, all the boom mics, you know, that are like, that are picking up the sound or you don't see the editing process. Because that's hidden away, you can immerse yourself into the piece of art, right? Whereas with video games, you will, you usually always have a heads up display. When you're playing The Witcher and dialogue trees pop up, you see the words that are getting selected that is non-diegetic to the world. It's not like if we're literally thinking of what's happening in the story world. Like we're thinking about our choices and the two word bubbles pop up to like, to, to select, you know? His argument was that because video games by their nature could not ignore that aspect of how to interact or immerse yourself with them, that somehow precluded them from being considered art. Now he's wrong. <laughs> I'm not even gonna say that as if it's an opinion. Like we we have seen how video games are art, and in fact, if you uh, if you look up, I think it, I can't remember what it is. I think it's Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. He will he will argue on what art means in the human experience and why. In fact, I think it's necessary um, for for human evolution or whatever. But that's a whole different like side conversation. The idea here is a lot of times for the sake of immersion, DMs will a lot of times try to hide the structure of their session. Whereas I think if you make it transparent, it actually lends itself to immersion because you can process the mechanics faster, which means now you can you have you have more freed RAM basically to immerse yourself in the world. So instead of being like, don't worry about the mechanics, just describe what you want to do. Now to certain players, you're gonna make them slow down because they're gonna try to figure out how to meld the mechanics with the story thing. Instead of letting the mechanics get out of the way and then dive right into it, you know? Um, and when I talk about the structure of a session, I, I mean like there are hard parameters that you can adjust to get the most energy out of your table which includes how much time you're investing in the game, um, what style of game that you've had, um, when you choose to end your session. I actually think that if you try to, try to go too long or you cut it too short, that is going to impact the amount of energy you leave your players with. And Ian, you had mentioned, uh, I had mentioned to you Friday night, like the way you ended that session was perfect because to me, the ideal time uh, to end a session is when the chapter is closed, when you've closed the information loop. That's not necessarily going to work every time. We've talked about how like if someone has an emergency and have to leave the session early, we might have to cut it a little bit early. Um, but there is a time where, and Adam was talking about this in Grey Owls with the energetic arc, where you know if you're gonna go past midnight, everyone's gonna get weird. So, <laughs> so how do you time out and structure the amount of information you're giving? So you're not, you're, you're ending the chapter, right? And I think if you're trying to think of your campaign as a long arc of like, it's just continual play until we stop and pause, like you're going to 
be a little less efficient in cultivating that energy through play as opposed to giving it a neat end cap where all of a sudden you're leaving everybody on a high and uh, in letting them anticipate when the session's gonna get picked up next time. So there are some huge old guard um, reasonings behind why mechanics were always discouraged at the table. And it had to do a lot with, unfortunately, the, uh, the relationship, the antagonistic relationship between DMs and players. So it became, how dare you question me and just take it for what it is, otherwise rocks fall, everyone dies. Uh, and let's tell a good story. Whereas the more that we break down these walls and we, we run into those, those weird gray areas in the middle of it too, where we start to reveal the mechanics and then you have players argue against you about those mechanics. So like, that's not how it says in the book and that's not the, and then, but that's all coming from experiences that they had to justify their, their actions, every single thing every single, I use this as a bonus action, I use this as my action, and then I do this because this is what it says in the book. And it's always coming from this weird defensive space of, ah, oh, this is why it works, right? Because you can't argue it, this is why it works. And that's all coming from the old guard. That is coming from the old tables where people only told the story as a narrative space, all the rules were done behind the screen, any roles that we did were uh, behind the screen and we'd and people would fudge them and whatever uh, But it's it's like the DM says it the DM is God and therefore the players now react and It's that relationship that we're finding that that is breaking down and what we're finding out is there's a, a great amount of intense and powerful value to Revealing the mechanics in play. It's really cool to be able to just like take away the screen and roll live in front of the players. That's a great first step in that, by the way, all you listening DMs. Uh, it, it's nerve wracking the first time because you're like, well, what if my monster fails, <laughs> you know? Oh no. But that's also part of the variables of the game. If the players can do it, it's kind of cool if you, if you do it too. You can also lean back into this happens narratively. This plays out this way, how do you react? But you can also put them in those terms. And when we reveal the game state in, uh, this kind of open space for the players, what does this then give them? And we have to remember, we've said it before, we're always teaching. The people at our table, when we play together, there are people at that table that wanna be DMs and may not know that right away. They might be playing as players and go, oh, you know, I really wanna do this. And we are doing a disservice to them if we're teaching them instead that what I say goes and that's it and you don't get to know the mechanics because nah, nah, there's no reason for that. When wouldn't it be better if we all were aware of the mechanics and I said, hey, this is sort of a circumstantial ruling. We're gonna kind of stretch the bounds of what's written in the book and this is how I'm choosing to rule it and this is why. Well, let's play through that. And that also gives a great example for anyone who is learning to DM or is DMing also and on other tables. This is an example of how we could do it agree or disagree we can analyze it later cool but it's all out in the open that we as a table are we can take a take out the game or sorry bring out the game state it's not a secret none of this has to be a secret and how much more valuable is our table how much more enjoyable and energizing is our table if everything is out in the open and I say everything in the sense of the game state and the game, and the game structure. And that's why when I started, I had, I had uh, uh, not misgivings, but um, a hesitancy to reveal an act structure in my games. Uh, and then I, I bit the bullet and did it anyway. And that elevated the experience tremendously for the players by being able to say, now we've closed act, act one. We have now closed act two. And now we also understand, okay, we have two hours left. It's gonna take about two hours to do the next act. We have an end, an end goal in mind. We know how long this is going to be. And we know that we have made progress. And all of that is our story structure. We can plan out if they have this discussion, it's act one. 
they could finish act one immediately. <laughs> it's, it's done. Okay, cool, we're in act two. And it just shows that I planned for these, this part of the chapter, these, this chapter. Uh, and it, it lets you know this is your progress bar for the story. And in a way, it's your own heads up display <laughs> to understand where you're going. But I was so hesitant for that because it gave up that old guard control. And it gave up that like the story ends when I say it ends. But why to, Why would I hold on to that? I'd hold on to that because of tradition, because of where the game state came from and where the legacy came from. But now that we're sort of breaking down those walls, how much more elevated and energizing are our tables once we've ripped away and broken down a lot of those things that people have continued to hold on to. Thank you so much for listening to some of our podcast highlights. This podcast is part of the Darkmore Podcast Network. If you want to support the content creators, feel free to visit our Patreon. And please, game responsibly.